Welcome everybody to today's um, Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership webinar. This is the first in our advancing leadership series and we're looking at personal leadership in action. My name is Zoe Arden and I'm going to be chairing today's webinar. Um, I'm delighted to have with me um, a fantastic panel of speakers, uh, Sudanshu Palsuli, educator and leadership coach, um, has written a number of books in this space, Patrick Hull, previously leadership development, now strategy director at Unilever, and Jessica Palalaji, head of resource management at Marks and Spencer. So welcome to all our panelists and welcome to those of you who are joining us live. We have over 400 people joining us um, from around the world and a number will be listening to this recording afterwards. So, so welcome everybody. Um, just um, a few technicalities. Um, you are welcome to ask questions via the chat function. A recording will be available afterwards. We've had a number of questions received in advance, many questions, so, so thank you for those. We're looking forward to getting through those. Um, and a few leadership um, series webinars coming up shortly. So this is our agenda for today. We're basically looking at personal leadership in action. Um, we're going to start with a bit of the framing of the context from Sudanshu. Then we're going to look at the inner game of leadership, three considerations, understanding yourself, cultivating self-awareness, deepening your authenticity and clarifying your purpose. And then we're looking at the outer game of leadership, specifically understanding the context and developing a systems mindset. And a final takeaway, which seems particularly important at the moment, is around building your resilience. Um, and just a word on that, it's an incredibly challenging time with COVID-19 and um, never has it been a more important time to be looking at how we can strengthen our personal leadership. So um, thinking of you all. So firstly, just some evolving um, thoughts, evolving leadership, quick insights from CISL. Yes, we've been working in this space for over 30 years um, with um, many organizations globally and we've got a number of reports and um, courses in this area um, and we we'll, we'll build on that insight. We have the Cambridge leadership model and you can see that we'll be specifically focusing on, on, on the bottom half of this model today looking at personal leadership in action so guided by purpose, the necessary thinking values and practice and then about being reflective and adaptive and this webinar is specifically responding to requests from our network and beyond really to dive more into personal leadership so so we're responding to that so firstly I'd like to open up to Sudanshu Palsuli Sudanshu is the author of a number of books um, more recently the social leader redefining leadership for a complex social age one of my personal favorites I have it here and um, published this year rehumanizing leadership putting purpose and meaning back into business. So Sudanshu, if you can just give us a, a framing of the context. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zoe. I'm delighted to be on this webinar uh, at a time in history which is rather momentous. And uh, hopefully a lot of the things that we talk about today are going to be supremely relevant to the context we are in. So we are talking about evolving leadership in the sense, is the kind of leadership that we have heard of and even practice until now, is it relevant for today's complex age? Or do we need to move from a more, you know, the heroic leadership model that we've always had to a more collective capacity for change? Let's take a very quick look at some of the contextual reasons for making this change happen. The first one is the yawning gap between the way technology has been accelerating and the way our human ability to understand the implications of technology evolves. There's a huge gap in there, and we are at the at the rising end of that exponential curve where technology is going to take us to places we have absolutely no idea about. The past is becoming increasingly irrelevant, not just unfamiliar, but it's irrelevant. So, so much of what we've learned and practiced in the previous century is starting to become completely out of date. And this is something we have to keep in mind because that also includes the way we lead our people and turn up as leaders. The next one is is so much is, is about how we are overshooting our Earth's capacity for sustaining life. And this is arguably going to become the most definitive uh, aspect of why leadership is being called upon to change and the current crisis that Zoe talked about a little earlier 
bears testimony to this. So these are the three dominant reasons for why we've got to change. Now, if you take a look at our leadership models until now, they all come from an industrial age where we learn to treat organizations and indeed the society in which we operate as a machine. It was very convenient to do so. We could apply the laws of science, but today that is becoming increasingly irrelevant in the rise of complex ecosystems. As a result of that, we practiced efficiency. Now, there's nothing wrong with efficiency as long as the world in which we are practicing efficiency stays stable. But when that very world, when that very context starts moving, efficiency by itself becomes quite inadequate. And the third aspect, which I think bears directly upon the way we lead our people and our organizations and societies, depended on power as one of the dominant uh, me uh, the, the one of the dominant tools by which we let our people. And that means top-down communication, uh, control, uh, making sure that what we control belongs to the kind of zone of knowledge that we operate in. All that is starting to become completely irrelevant. So the question that we've got to ask ourselves is, what is the kind of leadership we require for the 21st century? Now, if you take a look at that slide, We've been used to having leaders as heroes who exogenously from the outside work on us. This model is reaching the end of its obsolescence. I'm going to now invite Patty into the, the mix over here. But before Zoe introduces him, let me just quickly talk about the two aspects that I think I'll pick up a little later on. One, the need for purpose is becoming paramount and important. And number two, the need for empathy and authenticity. I'll come back to these points a little later on. Zoe, over right. to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sadanchu, for that um, excellent framing. Um, so we now want to sort of really um, dive into what we mean by the inner game of leadership. And we've got three points here. So firstly, this idea of understanding yourself, cultivating self-awareness. Secondly, clarifying your purpose. And thirdly, deepening your authenticity. And as Sadanchu said, he's going to come back and make some comments. So, so Paddy, I know that you've been doing a lot of work in this area and you'll probably start with the, with your context and then move to purpose and, and, and self-awareness. Yes, thanks very much, Zoe. So, uh, yeah, back in 2017, uh, when I was Leadership Development Director in Unilever, we also came to the realization, similar to what Sudanshu shared, that uh, the way we were equipping leaders at the time was not sufficient for the 21st century. And so we embarked on a lot of research, uh, crowdsourcing insights on what leadership would be required in this 21st century that was not so dominated simply by the industrial a way of thinking about the world, but far more uh, around ecosystems. One of the big insights we had from the research was that we really need to get better at equipping leaders to be able to respond and adapt to the rate of change they are experiencing. Uh, and I think that's never more evident than what we are going through right now. We're seeing a rate of change with COVID-19 and responses and reactions like never before. So how do we equip leaders to um, respond effectively in this sort of situation? Now, what we came up with is uh, what we're calling our Unilever standards of leadership, which had a very big focus, as you'll see here, on both the inner game, what we were calling the inner game of leadership, which is your uh, the way you uh, are as a leader, uh, and the outer game of leadership in terms of what you do uh, as a leader. And we really, for the first time in Unilever, focused and showed both of these as equal uh, parts of the leadership model. Previously, most of the focus had been on the outer game, what you need to do, how efficient and productive can you be as a leader, as Sudanchu alluded to earlier. Whereas the inner game is much more on who you are, how you turn up, um, how you've cultivated your self-awareness and purpose. Um, and so we really wanted to show the organization that this was equally important and in fact that we needed to emphasize that even more at this time. So I'm going to quickly work through that inner game of leadership, uh, starting off uh, with purpose and service, uh, first of all. Um, we recognized that coming from a place of purpose was probably the most important thing for leaders to do in a complex, ever-changing environment. When you use purpose as your North Star and your guide, you are able to make decisions in a very um, interdependent uh, ecosystem, if you like, or in, in, in places of systemic change. Um, I give a quick example of the Unilever CEO uh, who last Friday announced that globally uh, 
uh, all our office workers would work uh, from home. Uh, he made this announcement ahead of a lot of governments and that kind of thing, but he recognized that um, the safety of our people was of paramount um, importance and therefore made that call in the midst of a lot of other calls to take other courses of action, to do it more slowly, to uh, only move when governments move, all that kind of thing. But instead, he led from a very clear sense of purpose in terms of what to do. And I think that is the, the only way to be in these situations. The sec building on that, we then said personal mastery, which is essentially really cultivated self-awareness, where you're spending time on yourself and thinking about how you can bring your best self to a situation. When you're leading from purpose and consciously bringing your best self, that's when your people are gonna to respond to you uh, and your leadership most effectively. Um, what we mean by this a little bit as well is thinking about how can you be mindful in any situation of who you need to be? What does that situation need from you? Our chief learning officer, Tim Munden, often talks about meetings and you've all been in them where you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, this meeting's going nowhere. Um, this is a waste of my time. But you carry on sitting in the meeting and not doing anything about it. And he always says we need to ask ourselves the question, how can we make the best of this situation? Uh, how can I be my authentic self in this moment? What could I do to transform this meeting and make it better rather than just doing my emails on the side? So that's a little bit of what we're talking about there, always bringing your best self, cultivating that self-awareness of who you can be in that moment. And the Google research on leadership uh, has shown that uh, how leaders are is the number one determinant of organizational climate, which in the end uh, has been correlated with 20 to 30% of performance. So extremely important. And then once you have these two elements in place, then you can be more agile as a leader. And we put that in the inner game, not in terms of what you need to do, but in terms of how you need to be, the mindset which you bring to a situation, which is about being curious and courageous. You can be more courageous in making calls when you've got a clear sense of purpose, and you can be more curious when you are freed up from just thinking, oh, how do I need to react in this situation and thinking, actually, how can I respond? How can I experiment and learn the best thing to do in this situation? So in a nutshell, we've really tried to emphasize that through all our leadership development approaches, this inner game of uh, leadership is being equally, if not more important at this moment, uh, in time as a leader. And I'll allude uh, to more of that when we go into the, the question and answer a bit later, how are we going about doing that? Um, over to you, Zoe. Thank you. So, and then Paddy, if you wanted to just, you've touched on um, purpose, you've touched on self-awareness, and we've we've got some some more slides here, which I think you've, you've, you've covered off. And I'd now like to hand over to um, Sadanchu just to pick back up on this um, the third element that we've identified in, in the inner game of leadership, um, th this point around deepening deepening your authenticity. So over to you, Sudanshu. Sorry, building on what Patty just did a little earlier. You know, up until now, up until recently, except for a few um, people who thought differently, the dominant narrative in the world has been about a you know, a way of leading which is kind of depersonalized. So it's it's almost assuming that I can turn up as a leader and lead in a situation because the situation demands that kind of leadership. At no point did we ever talk about who we are as people and how we bring ourselves into the place that we lead from. There have been certain movements in leadership. I think transformational leadership as a movement was important. The servant leadership uh, idea was also part of the same genre, but by and large, the dominant leadership theories have all been about really the leader as someone who's got the skills, the charisma, the superman abilities, who comes in, swoops down, and sorts out the issues. Now we are starting to really understand the depth to which we've got to go in order to understand this inner world that Patty talked about. Now, you know, if you go back in history and look at the way we as homo sapiens, as a species, uh, we behave and what evolution has given us, evolution has provided us with two of the most amazing faculties that have been around with us for millennia. One is the need for purpose. 
life may or may not have a sense of purpose in itself, but the fact is that we need a sense of purpose in order to do things more productively, more meaningfully, and that allows us to lead more purposeful lives and work more purposefully at work. And the second uh, faculty that nature has given us is the ability to empathize, to be an empathize not just as a soft emotion where I feel your pain, but rather the ability to understand really what's going on so that I can then take more informed decisions as a result of that. So in my last book, I call them the two vectors of evolution, purpose and empathy. And the point is we need to use them more often, which means we need to overcome another narrative that's been around in society for a very long time, especially after the industrial revolution, which is all about self-maximization, that we are all here for ourselves. Our businesses are meant for shareholders to make money. No one really cares about anything else. I mean, yeah, I can pay lip service to the environment. We have CSR and all those wonderful things. But in reality, business is about making money. And I think the time has come to go beyond that narrative and truly come up with a new model in which we as leaders turn up in the most authentic way possible, because without authenticity, you cannot liberate purpose and empathy. So this to me is the third missing element in what we've talked about so far, the need for authenticity. What does authenticity do? Authenticity in my book is not about just being yourself. That's a, that's a very superficial understanding of what authenticity is. Authenti authenticity is something that liberates me from being shackled within an alternative narrative and being able to live purposefully, work purposefully, so that I bring my purpose into the theater of action. Right, So that's where I go from the inner game into the outer game. That's what draws me to the outer game. And the second thing that authenticity does is that it frees up my ability to empathize. Only authenticity, only authentic people can truly empathize. Uh, the, otherwise, it's, it's, it's a game. It's, it's something that we put on and people can see through that quite easily. So to me, what completes the whole a uh, scenario we've been talking about until now, which is be purposeful, live purposefully, work purposefully, create purposeful organizations. And Patty gave an excellent example of that at Unilever. I've been talking about empathy as a as a in a collaborative force to work with, but the two of them get activated, get liberated when we truly learn to be authentic leaders. It is not easy. It is difficult, but at the same time, as Patty mentioned a little earlier. It's all about how we want to turn up. Uh, and if Brilliant. each one of us takes that decision to live more authentically and to lead more authentically, we then start creating a climate around us in which we invite the other, people's, the other people to do the same thing. And that's when leadership gets away from that uh, hallowed uh, portal organization who is going to solve our problems to Leadership is something that we all can engage in. It's a space that we can all enter in. So I'll stop for now, Zoe, and I'll uh, make sure that we come back to this point again when we answer some questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sadanshu, and um, thank you for tying that all together. So as you said, it's like authenticity is, is really the, the element that, that ties together the, the inner game of leadership that you and Paddy have been talking about so far. And I now want to invite Jessica in. Um, so in terms of the outer game of leadership, firstly, just some reflections um, from CSL on this. Um, CISL has worked on a number of papers, including rewiring the economy, where, where we identify levers in the system um, where we can make changes. And, and Jessica, I know that, that you've got some, some thoughts around what the whole system looked like. So from the inner game of leadership, just want to touch on so we've gone from understanding yourself, cultivating self-awareness and the elements of purpose and authenticity within that. And now I want to touch on just briefly the outer game of leadership. So from understanding yourself to understanding the context and developing a, a systems mindset or a whole whole systems mindset. So so over to you, Jessica. Great. Thank you so much, Zoe. And thank you so much for Sue, um, Sudanshu and Paddy for really um, creating a great framework to just um, build on. Um, I put a quick definition up on there about whole systems thinking. Um, but I really just wanted to say that, you know, for me, it's I've highlighted the, the related because it really is about understanding the connectedness 
these entanglements, um, you know, how how do all the bits uh, interact with each other? And that, that definition is um, more to do with product because I'm coming from a retail perspective from Marks and Spencer, but really it is just understanding how things are related to each other. Um, so I'm gonna unpack that a little bit. So if we skip to the next slide, what we've got is a diagram, which I think is really, um, really great at illustrating the sort of the partnership that divergent and convergent thinking need to need to be taken to understand and how to define a problem. So really I put this on there because I'm really just wanting to touch on how divergent thinking is about thinking expansively, you know, so how do we really engage all of the people across broad parts of whatever whatever system we're trying to interrogate, how do we get them all to come together and really just throw everything on the table? Um, and so in doing that, we're, we're thinking more of a, a, a web or a hive, a hive mind. And then, you know, we need to define the problem. We can't sort of exist in the space where everything is about um, having all the ideas out there. We need to focus and be a bit more linear in our thinking. So then we go from divergent down to convergent. So we're narrowing it down. We're defining what we need to understand in terms of this diagram is talking about a problem. And then when we're thinking of solutions, we're branching back out again. So we're, we're going back into this divergent thinking space, trying to understand, you know, what are the solutions? How can we be creative? How can we collaborate? You know, so if you think of divergent as being, you know, why not? You know, why not? Why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? And, you know, the convergent piece is more like why? So, you know, you've got this really great idea of them almost existing in, as two sides of a coin. Um, so, yeah, so that's just a very quick diagram on divergent and convergent thinking within a system. And then next, I just wanted to hit on, you know, system thinker. What are some of the wins? So um, really, it's just moving and shifting these, uh, these mind frames. So we're going from being disconnected to being interconnected. We're going from a linear, you know, a linear line of thought where we've got a very um, structured, almost narrow perspective to being circular, um, you know, sort of really trying to understand how two ends come together. We're going from being quite siloed to being, you know, emerging to, to really breaking down those walls and breaking down those barriers in which we can talk to each other. We're going from parts to holes. I think this is really important because it's really easy to identify one part of a system and go, actually, I'm going to pull that lever without understanding actually the, the ramifications that may have somewhere else. So, you know, it's about trying to understand where do I fit within this uh, system? And then we go from analysis to synthesis. So this is really nice too. It's understanding within these connections, what are those synergies? How can we work together? And then I think the last one is, is on, uh, you know, is very pertinent for now, we're moving from isolation to relationship. So we're moving from this, you know, almost uh, quite fractured approach to moving together to understand how we can relate to each other. So I think the, the key part is really on the next slide where I just wanted to really um, pull in as a leader, what, what does that look like? So, you know, being systems focused and problem oriented is really just ensuring that you're steering the, the team, whoever you're working with, back to the problem, back to the issue. You know, how can we understand and how can we prioritize the factors and dynamics that make up this complexity? You know, there are huge problems and systemic change that's required that, you know, as individual parts, we may not be able to see how we can come together, but it's really about how can we make sure that we keep focusing on the system, we keep understanding and trying to interrogate it. Um, you know, this, the second point of that is being reflective and generative. And I think this is really, really tough. It can be really challenging and in, in, especially in corporate environments and most business environments where time, we're all time poor, you know, but it really is about trying to slow down and create space where we can have really good conversations that reflect on the way that we think or the way that we've approached something. You know, we may have already jumped to um, perhaps a solution or an assumption and we need to release those. We need to create the space where we can have these great conversations, where we can move to a more generative, um, you know, ideas of what we can do and how we can move forward. And then the last one is about co-creating, you know, how can we constantly think about this aspiration of health for the system? How can we really go, what do we want to create and what is this today? You know, and then how can we use that tension of the present and the future to really, you know, fast forward and be a catalyst for the creation. And I think language is really important, you know, so this idea of co-creation is, is really beautiful as opposed to um, a more top down. So I think a lot of the things we're talking about is almost like this collective leadership, which I think is really beautiful. Um, so the last slide, I think it's really pertinent. So I just wanted to give some time to it in yeah, terms of I building. 
and just to say that actually this will the building resilience is our final takeaway absolutely and, and then we'll get into questions so over yeah, to you absolutely. on building resilience yeah yeah i mean obviously we're we're you know the current situation around with covid and and all the other i guess uh other systemic and, and complex situations which have arose from it you know we're really thinking resilience and, and trying to interrogate what that means and not not for it just to become this almost buzzword which sometimes happens um in leadership and business and i think for me there was there were three key things that i just really wanted to touch on today and you know the first one was about being realistic you know i think sometimes we have an assumption that uh being a resilient is a, is a a bursting optimistic person um, but actually if, if you're optimistic sometimes you can lose it can distort your reality so it was really just you know reflecting and saying you know do I truly understand and accept the reality of the situation or does my organization if we were thinking more corporately you know um, and that facing into is hard you know and, and it's really just trying to accept you know where we are and you know if we are training ourselves um, to survive before it happens i think the other thing too is is having a grasp of what what is actually happening purpose so i mean paddy and sudanshu have already touched on this but from my perspective it was just trying to understand that value systems in, in a business and corporate sense like they sort of infuse environment with meaning so it kind of helps us to interpret and shape events so you know um a resilient business is actually the value systems don't tend to change very much so i think um patty had a really good example with unilever in terms of you know just stepping forward and making that decision um you know because that ability to react um is you know really a reflection of value systems that a, that a business has in place and then lastly improvisation i think this is really interesting and i've we've seen a lot of these examples come out of the current situation we're in which is this idea of bricolage, you know so how can you be inventive how can you imagine new possibilities how can you use familiar objects to unfamiliar uses and there's some great examples of businesses that you know have changed their business model so you know impactfully and rapidly in the face of covid you know those that were suppliers for hospitality are now you know creating um, food boxes to send to people's houses you know so you've got these really great examples of resilience where people have improvised you know so they've got you know a, a plethora of tools and they've just gone actually we need to be reactive to the situation and we need to think about you know how can we be creative in, in the way in which we can um, survive, you know. So I think that that's really interesting as well. So I've just touched on that, Zoe. I think you want to add some more, and then we'll we'll, we'll have more in the Q and A's. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jessica. So in fact, I'm going to move to um, questions now. Um, sure. We've had so many questions in, and um, we always want to make sure that we leave a really good chunk of time um, to deal with the questions, and we appreciate that. Um, some of the questions we've got in, people might be catching up with afterwards when they listen to this on record, um, but we're also taking questions as they come along. Um, so, Dancio, I, I want to invite you back in, actually. Um, so, and just um, specifically diving into the questions that we've had around um, purpose um, and authenticity. We've had a question from the chat. Um, so I'll go to that first before, before we go to our um, questions that we had in advance, which is um, your point about empathy. And, and when we've had a question, how do you actually develop empathy? I wonder if you've got some thoughts on that. Well, this is a great question and I'm smiling because um, we often talk about empathy quite so easily. And it's it's such a, if you, as a psychologist, I can tell you it's, it's a very complex psychological function. Um, we all, Every human brain is born with the ability to empathize in the sense it's a latent potential function, but it uh, doesn't really activate itself in every human being, right? So um, it, one of the preconditions for empathy to flower in a human being is that you need to interact with other people around you at an early stage in childhood and later on in life too, other people who are able to activate and, uh, and, and display that empathetic function. But by that I mean, it's a learned behavior when you actually come into contact with people who are displaying those same behaviors. So it's not easy. Number two, the good news is that it gets better as we practice it. So think of it as a muscle, think of it as uh, going to a mental or a psychological gym, and the more you practice it, the more we actually create those neural connections in our brain, which allow us to become more empathetic as we go along. And the third piece of good news is that as we get older, 
we do become a lot more empathetic than before. And this applies to men who generally develop the empathetic function slightly later on than women do. <laughs> so I'll stop for now, Zoe, on that note. <laughs> that's, see what that's brilliant. Happens. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Sadanshu. And actually, um, while I've got you primed, I just want to go back to the evolving context. So go back to the beginning um, and, and particularly thinking about where we're at right now. So we had a question um, which was, how can we use the, this global crisis to help expand our understanding of the need for connection and interconnectedness? And do you want me to take that on? Yep, if you wouldn't mind, no. and then I'll and then I'll let you rest. And Thank I'll come you. <laughs> I'm sure Jessica and Patty are are yeah. are just itching to get into this question yeah. too, because yeah. it is one of those times, right? I mean, we are we are staring at something in the face, which is telling us that the way we approach life, the way we approach our work, and everything we do is just irrelevant, is obsolete. Mm -hmm. And if, if there was ever a time in human history that allows us to step back and learn, this is it. Now, what do we need to learn? Very quickly, I'm just making it up at the, from the top of my head. It's an amazing question. Number one, we have to learn to collaborate across all kinds of borders and walls. And here's a funny one, because while we are doing this, our global politicians are busy building walls, literally protectionist walls. So I think there's a, there's a bit of a paradox in there. We'll have to break down those walls and learn to collaborate. Number two, we will have to understand that our self-importance is not that important when it comes to the big picture. All right, we will learn. We will need to learn to respect nature more. That's the second thing that we need to think about. The third thing we need to think about is how do we actually use this opportunity to change our behaviors and habits that are now becoming pretty pronounced. For example. Do we all need to travel the way we traveled? Do we all need to consume the way we used to consume? Can we scale down? Can we step back? So I'm going to stop for now, Zoe, because I'm sure Jessica wants to just get into this question. Right? <laughs> I, I, I can hear I can hear Jessica. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I mean, it's, I just really wanted to echo everything Sudanshu said. I mean, obviously, in the retail space, this is, you know, these all of these questions are very pertinent in terms of, you know, really understanding, you know, what what do we need, you know? And I think I think what what we've all, um, you know, really established over the, the last, you know, two months or even two months is, you know, uh, exactly what Sudanshu is saying. You know, how do we consume? How do we live? You know, what is important? You know, really just trying to, I guess, strip away. Um, and really have this true self-reflection in and around, uh, you know, what do I need to function? Um, how do I connect with people? I think the connection piece is really interesting, like you were saying to Dentro about, you know, making ourselves borderless when we are actually in the face of, of having more borders put up, you know. And I think that's been a, you know, a real, um, like a real, you know, interesting uh, concept in terms of how do we connect with people? How can we create new ways of connection? You know, because uh, we're all moving into a more digital workspace, but you know, the technology that we have, how can that be more responsive? How can that allow us to create, um, you know, connections better? Because, you know, we're still not used to having this, uh, you know, screen in front of us. And we, we, still, we, we still really love that connection and that physical space and energy and transference. So I think, yeah, I think what we'll see out of this is it will provide a catalyst for all of these questions that perhaps have, if, you know, we've put prioritized quite low down in the face of everything else, you know, um, what is the role of business, what is the role of retail, you know, so I think it's really is one of those times where we're, it's unprecedented anyway, so our responses will, you know, um, reflect that I'm sure. Yeah. Can I throw one quick one in, Zoe? Yeah, Sorry, I know please, you want to move on, but just very quickly. I'll just give one small practical example. I mean, I think remote working and, and this kind of uh, video conference and that kind of thing is definitely going to be here to stay. We're all going to uh, learn this, but even the way we do that is going to change. So I heard someone uh, on the television and the news this morning talking about how they have to work from home and now their children are at home and they have to be locked away in order to you know do their work and this is a problem and actually one of the things we've said to our people is please don't worry about that we actually posted that video that most of us may have seen of the bbc yeah. guy with the kids <laughs> running into the room and all of that and just said 
that's going to happen. You know, yeah. we don't know how long this is going to go on for. Uh, this is an emergent situation. Please don't feel like you have to lock yourself away from your kids and all mm -hmm. that in order to be doing work calls and stuff. You know, that's mm -hmm. just not going to work. So I think it's even going to break down the barriers in terms of how we see remote working. That connectedness is, is actually going to hopefully increase um, because we're going to be a bit more open, you know, in our own lives and that kind of thing yeah. through this. So, yeah, just an encouragement to also even rethink how we do remote working is, is going to be key. Yeah, absolutely. We, we talk about bringing our whole selves to work, don't we? And it's like now we're bringing our whole families to work. Mm. <laughs> So, um, and, and I loved your, your point there, there, Jessica, about, you know, really thinking through what we need. I, he I heard a great phrase this morning about what we need, not what we greed, um, which mm. I thought was, um, was a good one. So, Paddy, I want to bring you back in, just continuing with steam to, to some of the questions that we had in advance around understanding yourself, cultivating self-awareness. Um, and we had a bunch of questions, which I'm just going to lay out. Um, um, on this in this area and, and, and just give you an opportunity to come up with a, a beautiful blended response. So we had questions such as, do you believe including mindfulness and meditation as part of your leadership training helps to achieve the goals? So I think you know, very much building on what Jessica was talking about earlier. How do you advocate the importance of self-awareness when there's resistance from management? Um, and what are the best tools to use for self-awareness and self-understanding? So, so really picking up on, on the work that you've done at Unilever, this, this point around um, cultivating self-awareness and, 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 and the inner game of leadership. Great, thanks Zoe. Um, so very quickly, the first answer on meditation and mindfulness and how important is that is a very big resounding yes. In fact, Sudanshu was at our leadership forum together with us last year where Tim Munden, our chief learning officer, led a guided meditation for our top 100 leaders uh, on the, the final day when we were going through what is the leadership that's going to be required you know, to lead us uh, for the next year. Um, and that was the first time that it appeared at uh, a leadership forum where normally it's all about the do, do, do. But we've significantly shifted all of our, our leadership interactions to think about how do we include a mindful approach uh, to what we do. Um, and that links with your next question in terms of how do we um, you know, advocate for this kind of thing. Um, we take a number of different approaches. Um, one is obviously talking about the science. There's now so much research and science out there saying that we are, I think, distracted 40% of, 47% of the time. And not only are we distracted, but that also leads to a lower sense of uh, well-being. So this constant distraction and interruption by emails and all this kind of thing also, as Carl Porter said, leads to the shallow work that we never really do anything in any depth. And if you really want to do something meaningful as a leader, you need to be able to transform the system. As Jessica was saying, you know, you need to be able to take a step back, take a moment to consider, you know, what needs to be done. And you're never going to do that if you're not being mindful if you haven't taken a moment of self-awareness to think about where am I at this moment in time? Am I in the right space to be able to grapple with this situation? Or am I just simply rushing from one thing to the next? So we approach it with a lot of the science, help our leaders uh, understand that. Because again, I guess I wanted to emphasize, which was also some of the questions that you're gonna have leaders and managers in different spaces. We often find a third of our people are like super excited about self-awareness and purpose. And they say to us, thank goodness you're talking about this. I knew this was important. There's a third who kind of saying, right, convince me, you know, I think I'll, I'll uh, go for this. And then there's a third who's saying, geez, how can I rush back to the office and do some more emails because uh, this stuff's scaring me. And so you've got to take different approaches, you know, where you've got to go across a whole spectrum of approaches of bringing in great role models uh, and, and helping people interact with, with people who, you know, have strong empathy and that sort of thing. We've got to create the environment that says this is really important. So like, putting it in our leadership forums. We've got to bring in the science. Um, and then we, we've got to make sure that all the time there's, there's signals, you know, I guess, uh, for people showing that, that this is something that, that we value and, and see as important. Brilliant. Um, there. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. Um, Jessica, Stanchu, anything that you would like to, to add on this, this whole bucket of cultivating self-awareness? Stanchu, I'll turn to you first. 
Well, yes, I think, uh, you know, we once again, going back to something I've talked about before, we carry enormous reserves of consciousness in our brains, uh, stuff that we don't use. Um, and so much of our waking time is spent in, you know, almost being um, like machine-like, you know, we, we are robotic in our reactions. We are operating based on biases and heuristics. And the whole idea of self-awareness is to truly give us depth. And that returns in the way we turn up as leaders. You know, so if any of us is really interested in improving our leadership presence, as we call it, the best way to do it is to start becoming more self-aware. It's a wonderful mechanism for doing that. So I'll just give that as one more addition to what Patty said. Right. Um, Jessica, anything to add? Um, I think just, yeah, for me, it's just modeling that, you know, so um, anyone who, who's worked with me or worked with my team knows that I like to do this thing I call marinade, where I just <laughs> like to sit with something, you know, if that means it's out the window uh, on the train or I just, and I actually just call that time out. Um, and, you know, I think it's just uh, having that, um, I guess that ownership, but also that vision to say, it's okay that I don't answer an email within 30 minutes. I actually need to think about it. Um, I think we can be quite transactional. It's very easy to to sort of um, become in that default workspace. I think you touched on that, Patty, in terms of like the shallow work. So for me, I just call it out and just say, look, I need time to think. Um, it's it's a shame that I have to do that, but I think that's just been the nature of the beast at the moment. So I actually just, yeah, I say, let me marinate on that. I will come back to you. Um, but I really, I really need that time to, to I think, um, I guess, yeah, just just sit with it and just really understand what could be a measured response and in, in rather than just something that's, uh, you know, um, off the cuff. So, yeah, I mean, I really think that I try and do that and I model that with my team and I encourage them to do it as well, you know, and sort of just say, look, talk me through what some sort of timelines are. Obviously, we all have pressure and we all have people that we need to, to report to. But, uh, you know, I think that it's about trying to create space, as I've always said, you know, right, where are those moments that we can actually capture them and, uh, you know, and use them in an, an effective way. Yeah. Yeah, super. Fantastic. Right. Um, thank you all. Um, I love I love that that idea of marinating. I think it's I think it's a great one. <clears throat> I want to just turn to the the, the we've had a, a lot of questions on on the theme of clarifying your purpose and and again what I'll do is that I'll, I'll put them into the mix and um, it would be great to turn to you, um, Paddy and Sadanchu first um, on this. So the questions that we've had around clarifying your purpose. So you know what does it look like tangibly? for someone who is not allowed get on your soapbox leader to lead with purpose. Um, well, that's probably good. We don't want those type of leaders. Um, do you have any frameworks or powerful questions that help employees determine their per personal purpose? I think that, that's a great question. I imagine that was part of your process, Paddy. So I'll get to that one in a minute. Um, and um, so let's start with those two. Um, so what does it look like for someone to lead with purpose and, and, and what are the powerful questions to help people work out their personal purpose? So Paddy, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with question two first and, and then lead into to question one. So we run uh, Discover Your Purpose workshops in Unilever for all our employees. Uh, we've had over 50,000 uh, go through them in the, in the last couple of years. And essentially what they do, it's a day of storytelling. Um, so we ask people to get together in small groups of four um, and share stories about their lives uh, with one another. Uh, and it's stories about um, what did you most enjoy doing when you were growing up uh, as, as a kid? You know, what were some of the activities that you really enjoyed getting involved in? We ask people to tell us about their proudest moment. You know, what was something that they had achieved that they were most proud of? We ask people to tell us about their most challenging moments. You know, what was their sort of crucible moment that they've gone through in their lives that really changed them as a result of that? And we ask people to tell us about things that interest them now. What are their sort of hobbies or interests? What are the things that they just do um, because they enjoy doing them? And through a combination of those stories, what the, the people in the group do, everyone is tasked with uh, the job of finding the common theme that runs through all these stories. I'll quickly give you mine as an example. So, uh, and then people come up with a bit of a statement of their, their purpose uh, at the end of the day after we've, we've done this. 
uh, but essentially my purpose is around bringing the essence of Pollyanna into the room. Pollyanna in the English dictionary is described as someone who's excessively joyful or optimistic. And that's always been a, a feature of my, my character and who I am. I remember one of my teachers writing this about me back home to my parents saying, they can't believe how I'm always trying to find the positive in something. And so there were all these stories that I had from my life and I um, was very fond of the book Pollyanna. I really loved her way of helping people unlock new ideas and new ways of thinking about their situation. And I realized through going through the workshop, I hadn't actually realized this for myself, but I'd realized through the workshop that that was something that was unique to me and that people really appreciated um, about me, that I could bring that sort of energy into the room. So um, it's... Yeah, if you think of what it looks like tangibly, for me, it's just about in situations that I'm in, I always want to think, how can I bring Pollyanna into the room, especially in some of those meetings where everyone's just like going blah, blah, blah. You know, how do we um, transform that situation? And it's not about jumping up on a soapbox and all that necessarily. And in fact, there's lots of different ways we can show our purpose and simply through actions that are in line and authentic uh, with it, whatever that might be. But let me pause there and let Sudanshu uh, come in and, and talk a bit more on that as well. No, I think this is this really illustrates the point better than anything I can say. And what I've actually seen, I, I can I can testify what Patty's talked about. Uh, you ask these people about their purpose at Unilever and they give you the answer just like that. And it's it's not a contrived answer, but it's a well thought through um, answer that comes from the very depths of who they are. And I think it's a very it's a very simple framework. Uh, but the but the the whole idea is to liberate those stories from us. And very often we are so busy and we are so tied up in what we do that we in a way we have forgotten the essence of who we are. And it's to bring that essence back again and put it to use. So you see, there are two aspects of purpose. One aspect is to the self-awareness part, which is getting to know what your purpose is. But the second more important aspect is what use are you putting that to? And the interesting thing about purpose, and this is something we wrote, my colleague and I wrote in the book, purpose always goes outwards. It's not about me. It's about what I do for the others. So there's a tremendous element of service in that purpose. And no matter what it is, it doesn't have to be about saving the world. It could be about the way I treat one person who is a customer who comes to me. It could be about the very, very banal and little things. But in the end, if I'm living that purposefully, I make a difference and that difference counts. So I just wanted to add that to what Patty said because uh, there are two aspects to it and we've seen that work at Unilever. Super, fantastic, thank you. Um, Jessica, I want to come to you now and and, and run through some of the questions that we've had about resilience but was there anything that you wanted to add on purpose before we do that no it's all brilliant stuff yeah absolutely <laughs> brilliant fantastic well as you can imagine um lots of questions about how do we build resilience that came in um in advance mm. and also that we've had come through while we're actually on um on the webinar so um so I just want to, to uh, again, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you the array of questions that we've had in, in the sort of building resilience bucket and, and then sort of yeah. take your, your general thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, this, this point um, around um, how do you motivate others to take on personal leadership challenges, particularly as they require immense personal effort? So I think really talking to the idea of how do you stay resilient um, as a, a change agent? Um, how do you cultivate resilience in time of great turbulence and uncertainty? Um, and then, you know, if you're dealing with a sort of what I like to call soggy middle layer, um, you know, if there's a culture of reticence and fatigue at a middle manager layer, how would you suggest effectively managing upwards? Um, mm. And then some of the other things, and, and I'll just give you the opportunity to give your, not to answer each of these in depth, but just yeah. give some overviews. Um, yeah. So uh, how can, this is an interesting one that's come in while we've been speaking, how can you share measures that can be applied to a team setting to build resilience together? Mm -hmm. So can you share measures that can be applied to a team setting 
to build resilience together. So I'll, I'll get your initial thoughts on that and, and, and see if Paddy and Sadanshi have got anything they want to add. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, sort of reflecting on uh, this webinar specifically, but then, you know, some of the, um, just the, I guess the outputs, you know, because I think what I really love about all of these opportunities is it's really great to um, upskill myself, you know, and really have this almost luxurious opportunity to read copious amounts of books and articles. And I think one of the things that I've really uh, reflected on and thought about is, you know, that this idea of resilience is, um, you know, just building on what Patty and Sudentia have talked about in terms of your whole self. You know, I kind of really am relying on this real toolbox of skill set that I've acquired throughout my life and through the different, uh, I guess, avenues of my career but also um parts of who i am as a person you know so um I, i'd like to sort of really overlap m and what i've learned in different areas throughout uh you know in different situations so i think an example of that is I, I help run an art collective in london and so i'm working in a very community collaborative environment where we're we're, we're really just creating all the time you know and we are obviously doing lots of things around narratives and storytelling and sharing experiences so the things that i'm learning within that i'm really trying to then apply to i guess what is my business you know life you know how can i really um duplicate some of this real authentic connections um in a business sense but also you know um how can i model some of this behavior myself i think when i'm thinking about resilience i'm thinking about how can i actually touch on all of the parts of my personality all the parts that these component parts that I'm made up of, how can I actually use all of those elements to my advantage? You know, how can they help me, um, you know, uh, continue to be resilient, continue to improvise, you know, to have purpose, you know, really just try and, um, I guess, bring it all together, you know, because I think sometimes we, we compartmentalize our lives, you know, we think this is my business persona, you know, this is um, who I need to be in this um, framework, um, but actually, I think the the people that I've been around that I um, you know sort of look up to in terms of that situation are ones in which I can there is that authenticity within them, but I, I can see that they're who they are behind the role, you know. So I think that's really important when I'm thinking about resilience. I'm thinking about how can I bring all of those component parts together? How can I encourage that within my team? Who are you? That's the question I constantly ask them, you know. So who, what makes up who you are? Um, you know, where do you locate yourself? Um, culturally, that's really important for us. We always start a new relationship and connection with locating ourselves in our landscapes. You know, these are the natural environment that I come from. So we, we talk about things, um, you know, sort of uh, anthropomorphizing, um, you know, mountains and rivers and things like that. So it's just a real connection with um, everything that we are. So yeah. I think for me, within the team setting, it's really important to, to harbour obviously a resilient mindset you know and i think again that that falls back on the value systems that are in place but i think in terms of um you know sort of indicators um it's not it is i feel like resilience is something that happens after the fact you know so when people start a conversation saying i'm really resilient it's quite you know if you're going to a job interview it's always quite challenging to think how you know talk me through how you think that from the the, the outset you know sometimes you have to live through it where we go oh that you know and often you don't realize you're being resilient i think is, is another thing so you know i think we're constant I'm, i mean i'm constantly learning in this space about what it looks like in terms of measures i think it probably just how situations are dealt with you know so for me again i'm, I'm super encouraging i'm being creative and collaborative in solutions so i really encourage my team to think outside the box in terms of what are what are the tools and what are the the things within our um within our gift and how can we use them to, to you know continue the service delivery or continue to understand the system and the problem um, and just you know really you know just encourage them to be very expansive in the way that they think so yeah so I, I hope I've touched on some some aspects there and happy to throw it out to the rest of the team yeah that, that's 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 brilliant thank you thank you so much Jessica um, and I'll, I'll hand it over to the others just a, an interesting one that's just come through on the chat which I, I think is, is very much reflected in how we're having this conversation which is how do you incorporate vulnerability into your leadership um, mm. for example feelings feelings of ecological grief um, mm. so I, I think this this whole self piece is is really relevant um, Paddy yeah. Sadanchu anything you'd, you'd like to add up there add to on, on the point of resilience Obviously, so much to say in so little time. 
Yes, I'll try and be succinct and then let uh, Sudan to uh, come in. But yeah, I just love what Jessica was saying there. Uh, it was, you know, about tapping into all the different aspects of yourself in order to access all those wells of, of energy that, that we do have at our disposal. And it's so important, whether it's creativity, whether it's being in nature, whether it's exercise, whether it's meditation or mindfulness. It, it takes that self-awareness uh, around where do I get my energy from to then, because it's all about energy. When you want to be resilient, you need energy. You know, when you're facing tough situations and all that, if you don't have the energy, you, you can't uh, respond as effectively as you need to. So you need to know where your energy wells are, where those are of your team. So it's beautiful what Jessica does in terms of checking in with everyone on that and then use that in, in service of, of what you're, you're doing. You need to be able to ask the team, um, and, and so you need the vulnerability and the psychological mm -hmm. safety to ask this. You need to say, how confident and able do we feel to take you know, this work on? If, if you feel you can't actually ask your team that, they're not gonna be honest with you, then you need to go back to creating more of that psychological safety, being more vulnerable in front of them so they know they can respond. Because only when you get the true answer to that question, do you know how resilient you can be uh, going forwards as a team. Do you agree, Jeff? Yeah. Don't you? Anything you'd like to add? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> you've heard some wonderful insights until now. All I can add is uh, that if you, the Patty's point about the safety being important for the vulnerability, you, we, we have to be vulnerable. We have to bring that vulnerability into the team and encourage our team members to do so. But they'll only do so if you've given them a safe space. Otherwise, mm. we shut down, we posture, we pretend to be what we are not, what Jessica was talking about earlier, and it just defeats the purpose. And I think it's important to watch oneself in terms of how is one coming across to the others? And I, I have a very simple framework I'll share with you. I call it the CAB. You have, each one of us has a CAB framework, C-A-B. C stands for conversations, A stands for actions, B stands for behaviors, right? So at, on any day, just take a mirror and look at your own CABs what are the conversations you're having with your people? What actions are they seeing you take? And what behaviors are they seeing you display? Are they authentic? Do you, do you display the whole vulnerable aspect of it? Do you display resilience? Do you have those conversations with your people? And it's a wonderful way to just do a check on yourself every now and then, or ask people, they'll give you feedback. So that's the thing I just wanted to add to the mix. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So we're, we're coming to um, our last few minutes of, of this webinar and uh, lots and lots of questions and um, really appreciate the interactiveness of, of, of our audience. And I feel like we, we've covered it off a lot of uh, a lot of those questions. Um, so I'm just wondering if um, so just we've had a, a, a very nice um, comment actually from 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 one of the participants, which is um, I have to jump into the next call in a minute, but thank you so much for making this webinar happen. It's been really uplifting in these uncertain times. I appreciate the effort and preparation that went into it. it makes me feel quite emotional. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you for that feedback. I think feedback is, is, is a wonderful gift and um, absolutely. Um, so so last, last thoughts really. So the title of this webinar is a Personal Leadership in Action. We've covered off purpose, um, self-awareness, um, authenticity, vulnerability, understanding the, the, the context and developing a systems mindset. And we've spent a lot of time um, really exploring resilience. Um, would like to invite each of you um, just a, a last word before, before I close, if, if there's any final takeaway that you'd like to, to give to people that are joining us live now or will be listening later. Um. Yeah, I, can, I just as I didn't prepare yeah, for I, that. <laughs> I've got I've got one. I just wanted to to share. Um, I think uh, for me personally, um, sometimes I walk into a room and there is a lot of people that look like me, um, in terms of being a person of color and and a woman. So I I think my my big sort of my key takeaway would be, don't think that you shouldn't be there. You know, so you know I think it's instead of thinking why me, think why not me. And also use that to your advantage, because I can tell you now, there are people who would have underestimated 
uh, based on assumption and bias and all those things that we know that we're all working on, but actually you can use that to your advantage, you know, so there are covert ways in which you can <laughs> really turn a situation around to be more beneficial for you than you may have thought in the first instance. So my, my, my one word would be, you know, you should be at the table. Lovely, brilliant. Thank you, Jessica. Paddy? Wow, I think that's beautifully put. Um, I think the only other thing I would add is, uh, yeah, just to be really purposeful and mindful about uh, all your interactions um, so that actually you can uh, try and overcome some of those biases and, and assumptions. So really think about the person who's in front of you, what you can do for them. How can you be in service uh, of them? Wonderful, thank you. And, and Sadantia, a final word from you. Gosh, okay. I'll just evoke the title of my new book, Rehumanizing Leadership. I, I think I think it's time we went back to humanizing our relationships, humanizing our workplaces, humanizing everything we do to ask the question, what does it mean to be completely human? Because we are not. We we are truly, uh, you know, this this is a time when we can actually step back and ask that question to ourselves. Let's let's begin the process of rehumanizing again. That's that's my last take on this. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, massive thank you to Paddy Polyanahal, uh, Jessica <laughs> Palalaji, and uh, Sudanshu Palsuli for, for joining us in what's been a, a wonderful conversation today. And thank you all who are joining us live or, or be listening to this later. And just a reminder, dates for your diary of the, the next two webinars that we've got coming up. So um, thanks to our panelists and thanks to all of you for your wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.